Es un honor para GRAE ser la sede de la séptima reunión de la red de evaluación de impacto. Gracias a Felipe por la confianza depositada en la institución para organizar este evento. Mi rol en este momento es simplemente darles la bienvenida, desearles una reunión provechosa, productiva, instructiva, este, educativa y que eh, tanto Grade como Lima los acojan de la mejor manera. Estas son las últimas palabras que se van a decir en español. La reunión se conduce en idioma inglés, so uh, let me just uh, finish by saying uh, welcome to Lima, welcome to Grade, and I hope you have a, a, an enjoyable and productive meeting. Thank you. I am not going to take much time, uh, much of your time. Uh, welcome. Uh, for us, it's a great pleasure to have the seventh meeting here in Lima. Uh, thank you, Grade, for 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 hosting the the meeting, and. Uh, I hope that we have a very productive uh, meeting. I am not going to say something uh, more than that, uh, and let's uh, go straight to the program. So, Justin, uh, you are on the spot. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Lima. Um, I was telling Felipe beforehand, I lived in Lima briefly 15 years ago and haven't been back since, um, but it looks uh, mostly the same as I remember it. Um, all right, this is a uh, paper called Context Matters for Size, Why External Validity Claims and Development Practice Don't Mix. Um, I am somewhat a uh, strange person probably to have uh, as the opening speaker, because um, I want to start off uh, our workshop with a skeptical note about some of the things we do um, in impact evaluation. Uh, to be uh, as provocative as possible, Um, the thesis of this talk would probably be best described as that when we do impact evaluation, the paradigm of how impact evaluation is done um, involves a combination of rigorous empirical methodologies that we're all familiar with, a kind of an obsession with clean identification of causal effects, combined with, I almost want to say, a central planning approach to how policy is made that our rigorous impact evaluation should inform a very top-down uh, approach to informing policy. Uh, so to describe it in kind of maybe overly generalized terms, we do, we produce rigorous evidence about what works. Uh, we use that evidence to eliminate policies that don't work or that lack evidence. Um, and when we've identified a policy or an intervention, often described somewhat in the abstract, that works, we then attempt to scale it up, uh, these demonstrated policies. So the, the sort of paradigmatic example that we always use um, is kind of clinical trials of vaccines, right? If any of you have been in the position of trying to convince uh, an implementing partner to do a randomized trial, you probably begin by explaining to them, well, it's just like in medicine, we do randomized trials to find out which drugs work and which drugs don't. Um, and so the kind of the paradigmatic example of a vaccine, <clears throat> pardon me, is that once we find out which drug works to treat this disease, then it's simply a matter of top-down logistics to fund and scale up the rollout of that drug or that vaccine to the general population. So what we want to argue in this paper, and this is mostly a literature review, I should be very clear, I'm reviewing a little bit of my own work, but mostly other people's work, mostly a kind of polemical review maybe of the literature, um, what we want to claim is that the applicability of this kind of vaccine model of how we do impact evaluation and make policy has actually very narrow scope in most development economics considerations. All right. So let me get into the outline here. I'm not sure, I hope that's clear enough. Um, I'm going to start off, we're very, We're very aware um, of the concern that what I'm describing so far uh, will appear to some people as a straw man, that nobody actually advocates doing one or a few randomized trials, finding a policy that works, and then scaling it up around the world. So we want to document kind of four characteristics of impact evaluation, of the impact evaluation literature that we think implicitly embody really strong assumptions about the external validity of the evidence we're producing. Uh, and then we'll go into the, the meat of what I have to say, 
um, arguing that our current approach often puts too much weight on a narrow definition of rigorous evidence at the expense of consideration of broader contextual factors. Uh, and we'll review the enormous literature on class size effects. Uh, you know, most of what I'm going to talk about then is a number of examples from the economics of education literature. I first gave these slides uh, when I was asked to present on the topic of what are we learning from the impact evaluation literature on interventions to improve learning. And so the argument throughout is going to be that a large part of what we're learning from impact evaluations is that there's really radical heterogeneity in what works. That the evaluations are producing very different answers in very different places. And we're going to illustrate that in the case of class size effects, in the case of the returns to private schooling. Uh, and then in the last part, I want to talk a bit about what do we, how do we learn from experiments when we assume there is heterogeneity. Uh, and I'll use an example of uh, an evaluation I was involved in of contract teachers um, and talk a little bit about the non-random placement of randomized trials. We don't just pick a place on the globe and pick an institution to work with and run a randomized trial. Uh, there's some selection issues here. And then talk about the, common, the most common response when we raise concerns about external validity and impact evaluations is that we have econometric tools to deal with those. Specifically, we can measure heterogeneous treatment effects in our samples, use those heterogeneous treatment effects as a bridge to broader generalizability. And I want to talk about looking at the Mincerian returns to education literature, how far that can get us. All right, so let me describe as I see it the kind of current paradigm of how we think about impact evaluation and kind of four examples of how strong external validity assumptions are built in, really focusing on the economics of education. The first is this sort of lexicographic evidence rankings. We have a preference when we review evidence, first and foremost, that we have clean identification of a causal result, and then other considerations kind of come after. So this is, in the United States, we, our Department of Education has uh, compiled something called the What Works Clearinghouse. And it's literally a website where educators can go online and find out what kinds of interventions work to improve schooling. Now, if you want to submit your study as part of the evidence base to the Department of Education in the United States, they have a, a system for evaluating evidence and ranking it. The first hurdle is that your study be randomized. If your study is not randomized, it will never fully meet the standards for quality of evidence for the Department of Education. So that means if I have a non-randomized study from some part of New York and I'm interested in developing education policies in New York, the Department of Education will point me instead to results from a randomized trial in a very different context in Mississippi, say. Um, so first preference always for randomization when ranking evidence. Second example of how we implicitly have strong external validity assumptions, a kind of a policy example. We, the way we spend our evaluation resources, the kinds of evaluations that we conduct and that funders fund, tend to be highly clustered. I don't mean the, the clusters in your sample, but we tend to conduct relatively few evaluations um, in relatively few places. So the, in the World Bank, the push for kind of rigorous impact evaluation got a big uh, start with the Strategic Impact Evaluation Fund, SCEF it's called. It helps fill key knowledge gaps in strategic areas. Now, what I want to emphasize here is strategic means, in this case, selective, essentially. This is not an attempt, SCEF is not an attempt, very openly, to evaluate every World Bank project. Currently, the World Bank has about 1,800 ongoing projects. And of those 1,800 ongoing projects, um, there are, by the World Bank websites count, 146 impact evaluations in the field. That's a lot of impact evaluations going on. It's not that the bank's not doing a lot of impact evaluations, it's doing a ton. But that's about 8% of projects are getting a, a serious impact evaluation. So the, the paradigm here is very much that we choose specific examples and we try to learn general lessons from doing a really rigorous evaluation of a small number of, of projects. Third, when we turn to meta-analysis, what do we do when we review the results of studies? Um, we often see these kinds of plots of uh, studies. Now, I've picked sort of an easy example to, I think, criticize. This comes from, I believe it's the uh, Cochrane Collaboration Review of uh, Evidence on Interventions to Improve Learning in Developing Countries. 
Uh, and this is a compendium of a lot of very good, uh, many of them randomized trials of interventions to improve learning. As you can see, you can see the point estimate. There's a line there at zero. Some of them produce negative results. Most of them produce slightly positive, some, some of them significantly positive results. And then what the authors do is across all these different studies in all these different countries, we get an average effect. And so the, the final recommendation is based on an average of very diverse results. And in this case, I think it gets to the point of being sort of silly in that actually the interventions that are listed here are completely different. Some of these are conditional cash transfers, some of these are an extra teacher, some of these are deworming the students. This is an average effect of things to improve learning. And the average effect is about 0 0.2 standard deviations, apparently. A more serious example, I think the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, 3IE, um, now commissions a lot of these meta-analyses and their most recent one on improving learning in developing countries, you know, kind of the, the crescendo is around this table listing the intervention type, should we give more teacher resources, more buildings, more health, and then we have an average effect. If you give, you know, if you do a CCT, you're going to get enrollment up by, by 0.21. And this is our answer. And on the basis of this, we get some very general policy recommendations. Okay, the fourth example is the most obvious kind of use of strong external validity claims. I'm sorry, this is probably too small to read, but that's making global policy prescriptions off of our, our impact evaluations. So this is kind of a famous example. Uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Rumin Hay in 2008, I believe it was, uh, were kind of criticizing the World Bank in particular for not making enough use of rigorous evidence in their policy making. And so they, they did this thought experiment and said, why doesn't the bank just throw out all of its programming, stop doing everything that it's doing, and let's look at the, the interventions that have been proven through rigorous impact evaluation to work, and let's put all of that money into those interventions which we've shown through randomized trials or quasi-experimental studies to work. And in the case of education, we had you know, the study from Angrist et al. in Angrist and Levy in Israel showing that class sizes um, are smaller class sizes are effective at, reduce, at improving learning. And so on the basis of that, they do a calculation of how much it would cost to reduce class sizes around the world to a pupil-teacher ratio of 40 to 1. So we've gone from Israel you know, to the world in one quick leap. Um, the 3IE study on learning in developing countries that I just mentioned does the same thing. At the end, it says, okay, what is the outcome you want? Do you want enrollment or in attendance? What works to get that? You should do CCTs or health interventions. Generically, this is your answer. All right, so this is, you know, these four things, I think, kind of embody a, a one way of approaching impact evaluation. Now, my task is to argue that this is putting too much emphasis on the rigor over the, the local context uh, and getting a little bit too ambitious with the external validity claims. So, the simple algebra of external validity, and it looks like my LaTeX font's not translating well, but... Um, Suppose I want to estimate uh, a treatment effects model using data from context J and claim external validity to another context K. I have my basic treatment effects model where Y is my outcome, maybe student learning for most of what I'm going to say today, uh, and T is my treatment effect. I've got other observable controls in there, the X's. We obviously all know that if I use observational data and run an OLS regression of this equation, I'm going to get a potentially biased result. My beta hat OLS is equivalent to an unbiased estimate that I might get from an RCT plus some omitted variable bias. Um, now, I should, I should, as an aside here, kind of, I'm going to, for the rest of the presentation, somewhat sloppily refer to OLS estimates and RCT estimates. I don't really mean OLS and RCT. You can estimate your, your RCT with OLS. What I'm going to be referring to effectively is non-experimental estimates using observational data. It's my OLS example. And in the RCT category, I'm going to include both randomized trials, uh, regression discontinuity designs, good IV estimates, natural experiments, uh, studies that we think have kind of exogenous variation on the right-hand side and have a claim to clean identification. All right. So we know these things up top. Suppose now I, I look at the evidence for this treatment, whatever T is, and I find that the OLS estimate and observational data varies across contexts. I've got an estimate from context J 
that's bigger than my RCT estimate, uh, and I've got an estimate from context K that's smaller than my RCT estimate. What do I do with this? Well, I want to argue that I think it's somewhat an obvious point, but we don't acknowledge very often that at this point we have to reject the external validity of our model. Right? Our model includes more than one parameter. And we have to either accept that the, on the right-hand side, the treatment effect in J is different than the treatment effect in K. There isn't external validity. Or that the selection process, if these are small class sizes or private schools, that providing a private school attracts a different kind of person in context J than it does in context K. Some of the parameters of our model are not externally valid, but there's a tendency in the literature to assert the external validity of our treatment effect parameter and accepting extreme heterogeneity of our selection effects. There's not real, any real justification I've ever heard for that tendency. So to make this more concrete, let me give you some examples. Class size effects. Um, so here I've got a number of, this is not an attempt at a comprehensive review of the literature on the effect of class size on student learning, but to pick some high profile studies that illustrate the point. Um, and I've grouped them by studies that are using a very similar estimation methodology, starting with this Angrist and Levy study from Israel. Uh, in the first column of numbers, you see that if they run a regression of performance on class size, they get some bizarre, you know, bigger class sizes, higher scores, and they can explain that, that Israel tends to put special needs students, slower students into special smaller classes. You can control for observable characteristics, the 0 0.019 there, and kind of get rid of that effect. And then if they do their regression discontinuity design for a cleaner identification of the causal effect, they find a significant negative effect, um, bigger class sizes, smaller learning gains. Now, Miguel Urquiola in 2006 um, has an RE stat paper from Bolivia where he tries to use the exact same regression discontinuity design to measure the effective class size. And Again, he finds a small positive effect in the OLS, and he moves over to uh, the RDD estimates, and he gets something which is a little bit different, but I, and I think it's fair to say that's a fairly similar result. Niaz Asadullah has a paper in the Economics of Education Review where he tries to do this in Bangladesh. And what Niaz finds is using the exact same RDD design, something quite perverse, which is even using the the clean identification, he gets a positive significant effect. The bigger class sizes in Bangladeshi secondary schools are producing higher scores. So what I want to compare here is... Niaz's result is pushing the bounds of, uh, of plausibility, right? So his, his uh, OLS with observable controls is a perverse result that's maybe credible. I don't, I don't have a mechanism in mind. His uh, RDD estimates are implausibly large and positive. So come with me to the RCT side then. We have Kruger in the United States from the Tennessee Star experiments, um, negative 0.27. Class size is bad for you. Um, Abhijit Banerjee et al. in India come along and do a very similar randomized control trial and they find no significant effect. The point estimate actually on reducing class size in Indian schools is positive and there's no effect. If you look back at their data, you have to download their data and play with it, um, there is a positive significant effect in the, the OLS. But the RCT estimate gives you nothing and if anything, it's positive. Duflo et al. in Kenya come along in 2012, a very similar setup to the Indian study and get a small negative significant effect, and they go out of their way to stress that a key interpretation of their finding is that class size has a very different effect in Kenya than it does in Tennessee. There's a big variance between the Kruger et al. results and the Duflo et al. Pardon me, the Kruger results and the Duflo et al. results. So what I want to focus on as I talk about these results in the next couple of slides is two kinds of variance. One is variance between, if we look at the Angrist and Levy study, the naive estimate with no controls and no identification, 0.32, and the well-identified estimate, and the variance going up and down from across studies and across contexts. So variance between OLS estimates and RCT estimates within the same study versus variance 
of well-identified estimates across different contexts. Um, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip the TIMS results. So what I take away from this class size literature are three things. One, that the most striking feature is high variance, not the high mean. In India and in Kenya, we're not getting a high mean effect. Heterogeneity is real. Some of these results are statistically significantly different from each other across contexts, and it affects both the treatment and the selection patterns, pardon me, parameters, and that there's no clear encompassing theory to explain these widely variant OLS and, and quasi-experimental results as we would want if we were gonna make a strong claim for a, a unified underlying model. Okay, so very briefly, we can do, and I won't belabor this, uh, a very similar thing for, for the returns to private schooling. Um, I'll focus here just in the middle. Uh, the CA and Urquila results from Chile that probably many of you are familiar with, you know, doing the best they could do in terms of aggregating the data up to get around selection of children within, across schools within districts, they still find no effect of private schooling on, on test scores in Chile's case. Tabarok 2013 uses the exact same kind of identification strategy applied to Indian data and finds a significant and positive 0.2 standard deviations effect from private schoolings. In a short paper, my co-authors and I, Bold et al. study from Kenya, try the same approach in Kenya and get you know, a massive and almost full standard deviation effect uh, of private schools relative to public schools in Kenya. Yes, there is a little bit of difference if you look across when you can from the naive to the well-identified effects, but look at the, the variance when we move up and down the columns in the table. So to kind of systematize that comparison of the vertical and horizontal comparison, let's think about a policymaker who's considering OLS estimates from here. I'm sitting in some particular place, maybe it's Peru, and trying to make a policy decision. And what I'm faced with is a bunch of non-experimental observational data estimates from this context. And I also have some well-published, well-identified experimental I estimates. Wonder, so, it's a really issue, but it, it's biased, the estimated that for the that have some identify using the same data in the OLS without and then you get Yeah. Right, and it's, so it's off a very small you know, I've only got a few studies no, for each of these. But it was, they normally have like an expectation sign that, that we all that. And, and they also use like that. Your that. Okay. But yes, your interpretation is right. We're going to be, we're going to be calculating for what you're referring to, I think, is the experimental estimates. We can think of the mean squared error for our experimental estimates. Uh, sorry, you wanted to know for the non-experimental estimates mean squared error, we always have some sampling error, this is survey data usually, but we have this omitted variable bias, which we're going to calculate is the difference between your well-identified and your non-well-identified estimate within the same study. For the experimental estimate, you run a different risk. You assume that you've got a clean estimate of the causal effect in your context, but I'm sitting here in Peru and I want to make policy in Peru, and I'm looking at published evidence from the United States. And so then I have to worry about the variance of estimates across contexts. So if we do that across a number of different literatures, the class size RCT evidence, the Banerjee et al. study finds very tiny variance between the OLS and the RCT estimate, whereas if we compare the Banerjee to the Kruger study, and you look at the mean squared error just taking those two studies, you get you know, 100 times greater variance there. You go to the class size RDD evidence, within Angrist and Levy, the naive versus the well-identified results, versus across, and this is the one you're pointing to, very... estimates of cleanly identified, the variance across of cleanly identified estimates across countries. So moving right along, I think by now my point probably, you can see where I'm going, we have, we have a trade-off between two kinds of error. Mean squared error of the RCT estimate, the variance I get from being in the wrong context, 
versus the variance I get from choosing the wrong identification strategy. Which of these is going to lead us more awry? To different degrees, but in all five of the literatures that we look at, I'm much more misled by choosing a study from the wrong context than the wrong estimation strategy in a given context. Yes? Uh, so certainly, you know, when, I, when I'm doing this exercise, I'm doing the RDD literature separate from the RCT literature, but you make a fair point that in the, say, Angriston Levy RDD, we know that while it's biased, uh, the variation that gives you the OLS estimate is coming from a different group of students than the variation that gives you the, the cleanly identified RDD estimate. So point taken. It's not only a different estimator, but it's estimating. I think, so yes, I think uh, in some sense you're helping us, but, uh, okay. Um, given the lack of time, why don't I skip over the non-random placement of RCTs? Um, and I just want to finish on time, so let me just jump to the conclusions. Conclusions. For evaluators, what do we take away from this? We have some very kind of banal lessons, I think, at the end of this. Um, I hope they're banal. Maybe you'll disagree. Uh, for evaluators, first specify the context. The intervention that you're talking about may be both bigger and narrower than, than assumed. The interventions that I think we, we talk about in the impact evaluation literature are bigger than we think in the sense that uh, a private school is not just a private school. A contract teacher is not just a contract teacher. They're embedded in an entire education system. A contract teacher is employed through a ministry of education. Um, they need to be paid on time and so on and so forth. We define our interventions at a school level, but really that intervention operates within a given institutional context. Um, encompass rather than trump. We have OLS estimates. We need to explain what's creating those estimates rather than simply trying to bring in new evidence from another place and wipe those estimates away. For the evaluation users, um, two simple points. This is kind of people on the policy sphere or people on the funding side is to avoid a strict lexicographic preference of internal over external validity. Um, we're in conversations with the World Bank who are interested in the effect of education projects in Sierra Leone and the question is whether or not they should be funding more research in Sierra Leone but the ministry is not excited about randomization. Um, or whether they should find another country in another region, possibly in Latin America, that's willing to do randomization and get good answers from the wrong country. So it's a very live question, and I want to argue that they should be putting a little bit less of weight on that lexicographic preference for, for clean identification. And finally, rather than a case against randomization and clean identification, you know, the proper solution to this is just to commission more, faster, cheaper, rigorous impact evaluations so we don't have this trade-off between rigor from the wrong context and relevance with less identified results from the right context. Thanks. I, I, uh, I'm going to comment on, on the paper by, by Lanta and Justin. And it's a very provocative paper. Um, and they write it in a provocative way. I'm not going to go for the provocative part. I'm going to stick with the, take the argument very serious. And I basically, uh, because I think that uh, though I disagree with the conclusion, I anticipate that, uh, I, I think they raise very important issues. And we need to think about that. And actually, I'm going to show you that I've been thinking about that myself for a while on, on these issues. So the first pain point, and this is a bit of a restatement of my reading of the paper, but it's a bit different from, from the conclusion you saw, and, and I think these are uh, important points. So they, they, what they say is, look, at this point, we cannot rely solely on experimental evidence to inform policy, right? There's not that many out there. And I think that's true. We, we cannot disagree about that. And, and so that, that raises the question of still we need to make decisions and how do we proceed. They also 
argue that we need to integrate all the ev evidence I available. And I, again, I agree with that. I mean, um, and actually, uh, maybe for those, I mean, I, 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 I still think that, that experimental evidence uh, is the gold, is gold standard. Uh, but but it's also the case that I believe in, in many quasi experiments paper. I did a lot of panel data papers, which I still believe. And, and so I'm not claiming here that uh, something different from, the, from them. Um, but they go to an extreme, right? They go to say, let's do OLS. So, so that's, that's where it became very, very provocative. So. <laughs> So, le, le, I th but then I think there's less agreement might exist on how to do so, and right. Um, so I'm more like thinking that to integrate different pieces of evidence that I'm gonna comment uh, in the next slide, we need a, 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 a model. We need some theory, right? We can't just go with you know stuff out there. Um, Finally, they argue that the, their evidence points in the direction of concluding that observational studies are, and I want to be very precise, at least in some areas in the education literature, a better source of information in a mean square error sense than the limited existing experimental evidence for policy advice. I think that's the claim, to be fair. Right? It's not, you know. Let's throw experiments, and let's not do experiments. So they say, look, at this point, we got this data. We, in, in that sense, we get this conclusion. And I'm making um, more noise here. And I think the, the conclusion follows because of the existence of large effect heterogeneity in their sample. That's very uh, important in driving the conclusion, which may not represent the true war we live on may just be the slot of noise because they have very few experiments in the in a, in each area and presumably low bias in observational studies of the effect of interest which i think is is overstated in the paper i'll get back to that though this last point has merit and it is true that there is much heterogeneity in program effects and the experimental evidence is still limited, I not persuade that we know or are often able to know how bias are the estimates of observational studies, right? And in a, in a sense, think about this. Even then I disagree on, on how to do the, the exercise uh, and, or, or at least on the interpretation. Without an experiment, there's no way you, do, you can say what's the bias of this OLS estimate, right? So, so, so they basically, if you give up on having experimental evidence, you go back to a world where you say, okay, we know the selection, we ignore it, and let's just live in that world. And, and I think that's uh, clearly uh, unsatisfactory. We, we, we should aim for, for improve our, our uh, experimental evidence to get more, in my view, not less. Without saying that we are going to answer every question, there's a lot of things that are hard to experiment with, and there's, there's things that even if we can experiment, we're only going to recover total effects and not uh, structural parameters. We are going to have uh, to go back to modeling, and, and, and we will live in that world. But I, I think that if I really have, when I read this paper, I see the, the, the one big conclusion should be we need more uh, experimental evidence in different contexts or quasi-experiment. So that's, that's my clarification, right? So the paper, uh, Landon Justin, refers always to OLS estimates, which I call observational studies, versus experimental. But in true, they also have uh, quasi-experiments as well. Right? So a couple of years ago, I did a paper like uh, for a book, uh, kind of what do we do in education, with Esther has a chapter, uh, Berman, Hanushek, Urkiola, many people, right? So, so I wrote about school management. And, and, and it's unavoidable not to think about this issue because when you go out there and look at the literature, you have OLS, you have class experiments, you have experiments, right? So, uh, so we 
basically emphasize the question of comparison across results from different methodologies. Five minutes, yeah. For example, when we consider tracking, tracking is just one school uh, intervention, we report observational or quasi-experimental studies that find no or even negative effect of this intervention on a student's performance. Well, we also review randomized experience show with a positive impact of tracking. So if you really think, okay, you should go and say, oh, an experiment, right, should provide us more rigorous evidence in terms of its internal validity, you're going to get some conclusion. But it is true that that's not possible in that case because, as we said, unfortunately, for the time being, different settings are studied with different methodologies. So it's not obvious whether the difference in findings across studies are due only to difference in methodology or also to difference in the true parameters across the different settings. That's exactly what their paper is about. Even, even though experimental studies are internally valid, they don't necessarily have external validity. I'm just quoting my paper, right? An issue obviously not exclusive to experimental studies. That's also a disagreement I'll, I'll have with, with their view that OLS will have external validity because it's OLS. Therefore, the results cannot be generalized without further assumption. So, Basically, uh, so I basically I'm saying, look, I, I agree that the issue of external validity is very important. I don't think anyone in the development field will disagree with this, and and and, and basically, I don't agree with the way research was characterized. So, what are my main disagreements then with the paper? Some seems to me that. The authors assume that if a study is done in another population, it lacks external validity, but if it's from the population of interest, it does not. So my fundamental disagreement is about the estimation of the mean square error in both cases. Right? First of all, I find difficult to trust the estimates of the biases of non-experimental estimators. So, so uh, still, I, they do something that it's, it's fair to recognize they just don't do look like data mining with OLS because they have the experimental the, the experimental effect from from or, or quasi experiment estimate and then if if I understood correctly they don't start adding controls to OLS because then obviously they could try a lot of things until they get something close to to what they have so they say Let's do OLS without control. But, but then they should recognize that the, when they go to say something, extrapolate from the exercise they do, they also lack external validity. Because then you go to Peru, they don't have any experiment. They say, OK, let's take an OLS. So, well, people will start estimating a model with controls, with things and that, that basically could be uh, substantially biased. But then what is more, right? They are not doing o an OLS estimate in the whole population of the country and compared to whatever estimate came from an experiment. They are doing in the same exper experimental sample and that could have, for example, much less uh, variability in terms of the unobserved characteristics of the participants of the experiment relative to the whole population. So, for example, looking at uh, returns to education, in the sample of an experiment could give you a complete different bias than an OLS estimate in the household survey because essentially the population that in which the experiment was conducted is much more heterogeneous than the population at large. But that's, I don't know, I'm just saying that these are the kind of things why we always be worried about uh, doing inference with cross-sectional uh, data or in an observational studies. Um, with that, I'm not saying, you know, it's always wrong. I'm just saying this is the big concern. It's always been the big concern, and in my view, it remains being a concern. But also, I find difficult to see how to assess the variance of the true effect of an intervention at, across contexts, and in particular, given that they have very few, right? That variance is really mischaracterized. 
And it's driving uh, substantially the results, putting really very big variance uh, in the expert. In the, so, so in a way, it, it's very likely, although I can prove it, that the, 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 the heterogeneity of, of treatment effect is really exacerbated by having only a few realizations of, of it. But you know, these are, 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 are my main disagreements. Just zero minutes, so essentially, I was surprised that they didn't cite Donald T. Campbell, so then, uh, because he really is the guy who invented internal validity, external validity, and he was telling social scientists, we need replications, we need not one, not two, we need many studies in different contexts, and he was doing this in a famous paper in 1969, which is called Experimental Society. Anyway, I, I don't have zero minutes. So, so what we need uh, in the zero minutes I have is to do causal generalization, okay? And so let me just say, look, we, uh, you know, what is causal generalization? It's something I've been thinking about and, and start to do long ago. In a way, you can replicate a experiments. So in this case, Angris and Evans had uh, an, an instrumental variable, but it's basically out of random assignment in, in two points in the US. And then we say, look, this could do everywhere in the world, but we only have, you need census data. We, only, we have at that point Mexico and, and, and Argentine micro data, so we did it. And, and even though the line doesn't matter there, but it just doesn't matter, because e e even though even though they may look like they are very different, they, you can't reject they are the same, right? And after we did that paper, because it's doable, many other countries did it, so, so the only reason I put it in the line is that if you have time and go and look at all the papers, you can go about, about the line and start to generalize causal effect, and that, I believe, is a very productive uh, agenda without saying, without saying, that the, that's the only thing development economies or economies in general should do to to produce em em empirical evidence that is relevant for, first, advancing science, second, to do better policy.